Hello everyone. So happy Friday. I'm glad that you're here joining me. Where else do you have to go? You're probably at home stuck in your, your own YouTube bunker. So anyway, today is Friday, April the 17th, snowing, as you can see outside, more snow to come. Everything is terrible. This is episode 60, 60 weekends of backyard beginner beekeeping questions and answers right here. So I'm glad that you're here. If you're new, welcome. If you want to see what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description below and you're going to see line item by line item the subjects that we're going to discuss and see if that's of interest to you. If you have a burning question on your mind and you want me to think about answering that maybe next week, then go ahead and put that down in the comment section below the video. Also with each response that I give, if there's a product or something associated with it, instead of asking, how do I get that? Look for it down in the video description and write with the question. There'll be a link where you can go and read more about it or even get one for yourself. Oh, before I even get started, I uh, received an email today, uh, just as many do. If you subscribe to the Blythewood Bee Company, they are selling those oxalic acid vaporization irons, the really thin ones that fit in the flow hives and everything else. I did a video on them a while ago. And they're selling them at like 63% off. So they're like $29. Normally they're 79 or whatever. So I will put that link. I did forward that link on uh, Facebook on my Fred's Fine Fowl Facebook page, which you're also welcome to check out. There'll be a link to that. Uh, I have nothing to do with the Blythewood Bee Company. I don't get a kickback for doing that. I just thought that's a great steal. You can't even get them on Amazon for that price. So BlythewoodBeeCompany.com. Go check it out, the oxalic acid vaporization iron, and it is, I put the link also on my Facebook page. So, this is the way to be. So again, thank you for being here. We're gonna jump right into it. Lots going on. A lot of people have packaged bees coming, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit too. What do you do if those show up when there's snow everywhere? My bees are coming too. They're due here on from Man Lake, the Saskatchewan Beast. They're due here on Monday. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But I'm going to open right up with Ken Jackson's question. And he talked about his uh, better comb foundation that didn't install well, so the wires were a little loose. So I did have some questions about that because uh, all the better be better comb foundation that I got that's installed with the wires, the wires come on it. This is the better comb by a better bee and it's pre-drawn synthetic beeswax. We've talked about this a lot before and then on the ends here you have the wires going across which you can hook up to this embedding system also that they sell. That one right there. Again if you go to a better bee or better comb I get zero kickbacks for that. I paid full price for these just like you do. Although the wire embedding thing they sent to me. That was cool. But as far as the better comb and stuff, I buy it all. But uh, if the wires are loose, I was wondering if that was with the deep frames or have any of you had problems with the wires being loose? They sounded like guitar strings to me on mine. They resonate when you pluck them. But uh, that would be interesting. He had to use an embedding wheel on those which messed up the comb. So the bees are a little held back on that. But uh, that's about it. The bees are putting pollen in the cells, clear liquid and many others. That's the other thing I want to talk to you about. A lot of you are ahead of us here. No big surprise there because I'm in the snow belt. And as you can see, it's snowing outside right now. Uh, the spring nectar flow is kicking in. And this is time for you to expand your beehive. So if you've just got the brood box and you're going to open up that extra space, Having pre-drawn comb is going to be a huge benefit to you because when the dandelions and everything else open up, dandelions, clover, those are like the earliest ones. And when that nectar flow kicks in, everybody goes into high performance. So your bees are going to be multiplying inside those colonies and we need to expand it. And when they're bringing in nectar, they take up a lot of space with their nectar. So you need to provide that space. Otherwise, their natural instinct, especially this time of year, is going to be to swarm. So here's an example of where the better comb pre-drawn stuff is going to really help provide them with extra space because think about it. When you're trying to dehydrate something, if it's a liquid, the more surface area you have, the quicker it dehydrates. And the bees are trying to, of course, uh, turn nectar into honey and they're bringing in pollen too right now. So what they do is 
they spread it out into as many cells as they can and they partially fill those cells and then they're dehydrating it down and then what they do at night is they reconsolidate that into fewer cells. So it actually takes two or three times the space while they're processing it as it does when you have finished honey. So real estate in the form of cells pre-drawn, so using last year's comb or comb that you pulled off hives in the fall that are now clean and ready to go, those things need to be ready to get installed. So things are going good. Anyway, here's from Chris Evans. Hi Fred, I'm a new beekeeper and I'm starting with two hives this year. Both are 10 frame Langstroth deep boxes and I also bought slatted racks for each hive. I'm receiving two packages of bees. Lots of people are getting bees this year. In about a week, is there any reason I shouldn't use the slatted racks? No, there's no reason that you should not be using the slatted racks. Put the slatted racks in. Where do they go? Oh, I did a drawing. So, your standard bottom board is here. Put your slatted racks here. If you don't know what slatted racks are, I'll put a link in the video description. You can look them up. They uh, provided a space between your landing board, bottom board, and the brood box. The reason I like having the slatted racks, last year I started testing them for the first time, for me. They actually provide a lot of space when you go to put your package bees in. So you pull a few frames out of your box, you shake out your package bees into it, they go right to the bottom, they go into the space provided underneath your brood box in the slatter rack, which lets you push your frames right back in there. So put them on. The other thing is, when you're selling your bees for the first time, many of you are, you want to put the configuration uh, together that you're going to keep. So we don't want to be disrupting the bees often. So put in the landing board, slatter rack if you've got them. If you don't have them, it's not the end of the world. Don't where you don't run out and buy slatter racks just because we're talking about this. But it does provide extra space for your bees to be, especially when you're installing a package or a swarm. Those are, the slatter racks have been a big advantage for that. So, yes, put your slatter racks on now if you have them. And if you want to get them, I guess we could put a, a link for those too. They are sold by the Blythewood Bee Company too. They're also sold on Amazon. Man Lake, everybody sells slatted racks, and I think they're becoming pretty darn popular, even though there's nothing new. They've been around a long time, and I get them for a lot of different reasons. Check them out. But yeah, if you've got them, put them in. Next one is from Carl Nicholas. Really interesting. Do you paint your boxes to help the bees identify their hive? Thanks, Carl. So here's the thing. Honey bees have terrible eyesight. Let's just go there. So if you had like a five megapixel camera, that's about the resolution. It's pretty, it would look, uh, you know, grainy. And so they look at high contrast. They can also see in infrared. So they see the world differently than we do. And that's also why honeybees get very close to you and check out high contrast areas and things like that. So can you identify your beehives to make it easier for the bees to find their hive again? And then we can prevent some of that drift when they go from one colony to the next because they're right next to each other and stuff. So my first thing to suggest is physical configuration of your hive is the first thing that the bee is going to notice from a distance. So they use landmarks to navigate. We all know that. That's why they do the waggle dance. The more waggles, the more either the farther away something is, the longer they waggle or the more complex the terrain is, the more landmarks they are. So it can actually be something closer, but there's a lot to navigate. So these little waggles go in there and then change position clockwise to a waggle, counterclockwise to a waggle in reference to the sun. So, but when they get in close, they're visually looking at contrast. Why do you think flowers are the colors that they are? Flowers have very distinctive colors to visually draw in the bee. And what's the next thing that kicks in once they're close enough? Then the pheromones kick in and they navigate by scent. So, because somebody else also this past week asked me about why bees don't seem to know when they fly up to a tree that has lots of floral resources on it, the bees seem lost. You know, they get to the bottom of the tree and they're doing figure eights and everything else and they don't seem to be able to find those blossoms. Well, if they're not finding the blossoms, they're just not interested in them. So the physical location of a tree, for example, and the geography of that tree, and then of course, once they get in close, they're not lost. They're gonna follow the pheromone of whatever the bee, the forager that brought that back 
to the hive, whichever the, if it's pollen, if it's nectar, whatever it is, they did a taste test, they sniffed it, they know what it smells like, they liked it, that's why they're out there. Now, one of the reasons you might see behavior like that, though, is when the bees do find a resource, when the foragers find a resource, even though a lot of other bees are there, it doesn't mean they're all from the same colony or even the same apiary. So what they also do when they find a resource, and this is what I think is going on, we're just guessing based on, you know, past history with bees. When they find a new resource and they like it, you'll see that scout back off and then they start to do orientation flights again. And that can look like the figure eight that's being described in the question that I got. And I think they are registering the physical location of that nectar resource and then they're gonna go back to their hive. So they do orientation also when they're departing a resource and headed back home. That's the bee that's gonna go back and do a waggle dance. But as far as identifying your hives, where you place the hives on your property, if you have a bunch of boxes that look very similar, then what can we do to break that up so that the bees can find that easier in the, in the landscape? Well, one is you can put one by a tree, or if you've got a big rock or something, you can set your hive next to that. These unique geometrical features help your bees physically, visually locate their hive. And then when they get in close, what are they gonna navigate by? The scent to make sure they're on the right landing board at the right hive and that they can smell the pheromone from the queen that is throughout the colony. And then uh, they'll go right in. But since we talked about how fundamental their vision is, this is just for kicks, I drew this up this morning. The higher the contrast, the drawings that you put or the painting that you do on your hives, the easier it will be once the bees get in close to navigate to that hive. So like this one, we've got a chevron at the bottom, black and white diagonals up here near the top. So really basic geometry has shown that the bees can home in on that quicker. But of course, I also notice these hives are configured different. This one's got a flat telescoping cover this one over here has the cover that we associate with the flow hives, but any gabled roof hive. And what I like to do is sometimes paint designs on there. I haven't done that for many years, but when I was new to beekeeping, I did a lot of it. But you could paint spheres, black and white, and then do drop shadows behind them. Do you think the bees would perceive that as a three-dimensional object? No, they won't. But it looks cool to you, and of course, put the all-seeing eye at the top to let them know that you're watching them. But high contrast, basic geometry can save the bees time when they're coming in to find their home again. Once they're on the landing board, they have to pass inspection from the guard bees anyway, and they're gonna do that through pheromone. Plus, if they're bringing in a lot of resources with them, they get through the gate a lot quicker. A bee that shows up with no resources on it, no nectar, no pollen, goes through a much more detailed inspection. In fact, they can get the grooming inspection if those are bee weaver bees, they tend to work them over. Two or three bees might get up on them and start uh, grooming them over to make sure they're not bringing anything unwanted back to the hive with them. So it's very interesting. So yes, do things to your hive. Change the geometry. Put a, you know, a hive visor on it or something that has distinctive designs, a big X on it or something like that. It does help. It's been proven to help. Now this is a funny one, funny to me anyway. I got this comment from somebody named Yo Mama. You suck, LOL, hypothesis nerds. And this is about a video in Backyard Beekeeping that I did, question number 59. Put a drop of lemongrass oil in your batch of feed and save your money. This guy is just a salesman. So this guy being me. Anyway, normally I just ignore comments like that, but today I'm not gonna ignore that one because it's wrong. So put a drop of lemongrass oil in your batch of feed and save your money. And that's because we were talking about essential oils, how they might be used. That's pro health. This is honey bee healthy. And then of course, honey bee feed stimulant, beekeeper's choice, essential oils right there. Not a salesman because I wouldn't get diddly if you went and bought those essential oils. But if you get something, if there's an Amazon link, I am an Amazon affiliate and I do sometimes get affiliate links where they're qualified, which is not on every item sold on Amazon. So 
I'm not just a salesman, I'm giving you information and I'm giving you the information for free, but I wanted to point out what was wrong with the answer here from your mama. Put a drop of lemongrass oil in your batch, feed and save your money. Okay, you can't just put lemongrass oil in 50-50 sugar syrup and have that be the same thing as the essential oils that are sold for bees. One of the things that's missing in that would be that the essential oil is going to separate out. So you can't just put lemongrass oil or something else. And one of the things we can look at here is when you take something like Pro Health, this stuff comes from Man Lake, Honey Bee Healthy, the original feeding stimulant with essential oils. Everybody who's kept bees for any period of time has heard of Honey Bee Healthy. Yes, you can mix your own oils, but I thought it would be fun to look at the ingredients. Here for Pro Health, sucrose, water, spearmint oil, lemongrass oil, thymol, lecithin. Why would they have thymol and leth lecithin? Sounds like I have a lift. If they have lecithin in it, what's that for? Well, that's an emulsifier. So what happens is, you know, you take your essential oils, whatever they are. The essential oils, you can buy those on eBay, you know, any holistic site. You can buy essential oils. Almost all of them say, not for human consumption, by the way. Let's go here and look at Honey Bee Healthy. What kind of, what do they even, do they even describe what's in it? Here it is. Contains sucrose, water, spearmint oil. Lemongrass oil, spearmint lemongrass oil seems to be the consistent oil that you're going to find in these premixes. And look what's here at the end, lecithin. Why would they put lecithin in there? Because when you mix it, it's going. You can, you can emulsify your oil and syrup. But in order for it to stay in suspension, you need an emulsifier like, oh I don't know, something that's in all of these, lecithin. I will bet you that even this one has less than it. Sucrose, water, spearmint oil, lemongrass oil, thymol, emulsifiers, lecithin. So there you go. So um, Yo Mama here left out an important ingredient and I want to make sure that he or she understands that you do need to add an emulsifier you don't just need to create the emulsion. The emulsion is the practice of mixing it all together, putting it in your blender, whatever you do, and you'll see that it all blends up nice and that's great, but eventually that stuff will separate out. So that's the whole point and why you see less than so often is that that is your emulsifier. So it holds everything in suspension so that it doesn't settle out again. Although it is also recommended that you shake all of that out I'm not just a salesman. I put out information that's useful to people that are keeping bees in the backyard. So, there's that. I just wanted to help that individual out because I know they were looking for help. Next is from Christopher Keeler. I have uh, seen this being said with the problems of the mass exodus out of a hive. Has anyone ever thought about putting a tarp down in front of the hive, under the hive, before you extract so the bees vacate there on a tarp when there's bad weather coming in. And the reason this person was writing this is because there's a flow hive called the flow hive second extraction. And the thing is, if you don't know, I do a lot of product testing. I have a very thorough background in material analysis and evaluating in-service and fabrication of products of all different materials. So one of the things I was doing when I get something new, I push it to find out what it can take and what it can't. I also test things to see where the fail points would be. So with the flow hive, it was no different. In the first cycling of the flow hive, we opened all of the flow hives, all the flow frames. And we wanted to see, this is a flow hive right back here, and you can see the frames on the ends there. It's a mechanized system for getting honey out of a beehive. And what happens is when you cycle them all the way, they overwhelm the honey, overwhelms the trough at the bottom and the tubes and they're supposed to flow out into the jar. So what happens is some of the honey leaks down inside the hive. So to alleviate that, we only cycle portions of a frame at a time and we only do one or two of the frames at a single setting. So you tilt the hive back so that it drains out. If you did all seven, which I did in the first experiment, and enough honey went down inside the hive that did not come out through the tubes because it was overwhelmed. 
So a lot of the bees, as they do, whenever there's a high humidity situation inside the hive, the bees went out, clustered on the front, and I even went out in that first video at 3 a.m. in the morning or something like that to show that the bees were still outside. And my concern was that if we had one of those strange weather systems come in where it suddenly got really cold, then the bees would be trapped on the outside and potentially they could expire from extreme temperature exposure. But that turns out not to be the case if that happened. So I'm gonna give you the full range here of potentials. If the storms came in, if it got really cold, even though the humidity levels were high inside the hive because of the honey that leaked on the face of the flow frames. And again, that's operator error because I was over taxing the system to see what it could take. So the honey went in there and the bees did return on their own within 24 hours anyway. Business is normal. They recycled the honey, put it back in the cells and no, no harm done. But uh, so this person is concerned. Christopher was wondering if when we do that, if we're going to cycle those frames, should we not put a tarp or something down so that if they are stuck outside, if weather's coming in, we could, you know, use it as a shield to protect the bees. That is totally not necessary and for many reasons. One is that now we just cycle them in portions at a time so that all of the honey, 99% of it, if we cycle seven frames, we got a quarter cup of honey collectively from all seven that did make it down to the bottom because I took a flow super off. We put it in the garage. We cycled them all outside of the hive. We had a catch pan underneath. And then I wanted to see how much of that honey, if we cycle them all, uh, would we get how much runs down that does not make it through the tubes and into our collection devices which is you know a half gallon jar or a quart of honey or something like that so a quarter cup of honey was collected that would have run down the face of it so that's a quarter cup of honey that would otherwise have run down inside the hive and the bees would have to contend with it i would wager that when a lot of people pull apart a beehive when they're pulling honey supers off in the first place they drip a lot of honey in there. I don't know if it, you know, amounts to a quarter of a cup, but we're always dripping honey into a hive because even the cells that are between frames, here's a box, here's a box, here's the frames in between, you pull it off and you always see open cells of honey there during a nectar flow or right after a nectar flow has happened. So we're always sometimes leaking honey in there. And if you go back to those frames even at night, the traditional extracted frames, uh, especially when you're extracting the honey frames and putting them right back in the empties you increase the humidity levels inside the hive you can expect to see your bees out on the front of the hive or up under the telescoping cover along the edges and they're just out there so that the bees that are inside can help dry out the air in there and of course the interior worker bees are putting that honey right back in cells and they're going about their business so this really didn't happen again. So the idea of setting up a tarp and being worried about weather, the other thing is before you're harvesting honey, I know sometimes some people get in a real pinch on that because they don't have a lot of time to do it, but we're backyard beekeepers. You know, we don't have 250 hives. So we don't have to work, you know, sun or shine. Some of those people do. We're backyard beekeepers, so we can actually orient our activities around the weather and what it's going to do. So if you're going to get a weird night where it's going to drop down to 35 degrees, that's probably not a good day to be taking the honey off in the first place. But again, that mass exodus of bees only happened on my first cycle with the flow hive for the reasons that I described. And so this concern is really not warranted. We don't have to put out a tarp or some, you know, take some emergency measures to protect the bees when we're extracting from a flow hive. Uh, a full-size colony is going to handle that just fine and if we take the honey off slower than that and I like to do it on hot days by the way if it's going to hit the 80s and I've got full flow hives I'm going to be pulling some frames last year we did do um, five out of six six out of seven frames in flow hives without any bees going out of the hive at all at night or during the processing so things have improved a lot next is Aberland, I have two hives coming from Maine, or coming from Man Lake, the week of April 20th. Same here. So that's this coming week. So thankful next week is going to be warmer than this week, which got me to thinking, if my bees had come this week, how would I have installed them in a weather forecast of highs in the 30s? 
Okay, well, that's my situation right now. We have, we're supposed to get some warmer weather during the weekend, but this is a very good question because what happens, I think about this a lot, I would much rather that my bees were gonna show up in the first week of May, but they're not, they're gonna show up in the last week of April. So we're gonna talk about, this is a bee bus. This is how my Saskatras bees from Man Lake, which are really from the Olivares family in California, they're gonna come in this big bee bus and they're gonna come at a time, I know it already, when the weather is going to be bad, it's going to be cold, it's going to be in the 40s on Monday, because you know the weathermen, they're, they're spot on, they know exactly what they're talking about. There's going to be any deviation from the forecast. So, that's irony. Anyway, what do you do when you get them? It's too cold. How warm should it be when you install your packages? If it's going to be raining and everything else, remember your backyard beekeepers, you're in no rush. What should we do with it? Well, first of all, you bring these home and you get them inside and you put them right on your kitchen table. You have to do some evaluations for this thing. Let's say we can't install them into our ready beehive. So many people are getting bees for the first time this spring. Your hives are all painted, everything's fancy, it's all set up. You've got your better comb in there, you're all ready, your slatted racks are on, your hive visors are on, you're ready to go, you've got sugar syrup, you've got wrapping around feeders like these right here, ready to go on top and get these things going in the hive. And then it's gonna snow, torrential rain, some people, by the way, are about to get inch and a half to two inch hail right now. That's insanity. That's further south, and I'm sorry if that's gonna be happening to your apiary and where you live. So you bring them inside. Now we have to evaluate this colony. First of all, you gotta look it over. Obviously, it's an empty one. How many bees are dead on the bottom? You know, you got a, you got an inch of dead bees on the bottom. Or if you see a pile of dead bees on the bottom, that's not the end of the world. Because what you're gonna see is they're gonna be clustered up around this can here, and uh, most of your bees are gonna be alive. I'm just gonna go ahead and optimistically guess that. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna pull off the top of this, and that's gonna have your paperwork in there from Oliver is showing the, or the origin of the bees that you've just received. And you wanna put that in your folder and keep that forever and ever. The next thing you're gonna do is pick it up. This is, should be a three pound package. Next thing you're gonna find out is, and there's little handholds in this thing. These are really nicely made. This is so much better than the wooden ones. How heavy is the sugar syrup? Is there still some in there? Hopefully there is. Mine was completely empty when it arrived. Those things, who knows how long they've been in a staging area. We don't know how long they've been in transit already. So you're gonna feel that can. If there's already sugar syrup in there and it's still half full, because it's, it's really weird. One will show up, you know, it only has a third left, the other one's half full. Make sure that they're also accessing it, that they are able to drink it. Sometimes they didn't put adequate holes in the can and uh, they may not be able to feed the bees. This one only has, let me show that to you, three little holes in it. So you're gonna keep that can in there. You wanna make sure that those holes are not obstructed and that they can get to those resources. Next thing you're gonna do, let's say uh, we need two days before we can put them out in our beehive. So what temperature should we keep them at? Well, I'm gonna recommend that you take these to your basement and that you put them somewhere dark. And you want it to be about anywhere, oh, 50, 60 degrees around there. If Let's say it's 47 in your basement, not the end of the world either. Isn't that too cold for the bees? No, because we want them to slow down. We don't want them to be agitated, so we're putting them in the dark. Second thing we're doing is we're keeping them somewhat cool. 55 to 60 would be optimum because then they're going to consume less of the resources that they have in this can. And uh, also they're going to be less active. If you, if you think of it, some people think of it like baby chicks when they get those in the mail. You've got to keep those at 85 degrees. But we're talking about bees. You don't want to heat them up. You don't want to put them in the sun. Don't put them on your kitchen table in the sunshine so that you can look at all the bees and get them all active because now they're active, what do they need to do? When they're active, they're gonna consume, they're gonna move around a lot, they're gonna break the cluster that they're in. They also might need to eliminate, which they can't do because they're stuck inside your bee bus. So, keep them cool, keep them in the dark, keep them fed. Then, when the weather breaks, you wanna get them out there and install them as quick as you possibly can. On the outside, you could probably keep them going for about a week, but I would not do that uh, just because you can. Like if you've got a day coming up, it's going to be 55, but you have another day, two days beyond that, it's going to be 65, 
install on that 55 degree day. It's better that you install them earlier than you wait for a marginally better day. So if you've got decent weather coming, the other thing about the B-Bus is it has little edges over here that you can pry open with your hive tool. And so when you, you can open the end and you're shaking out the bees from an open end, they slide right out. Oh, look, bee parts from when we did this last year. Anyway, it's much easier to shake your bees out into your hive than it is to pull the can and shake them all out through this hole. You see people banging them side to side and slamming them and stuff and getting them in there. This is a very gentle way to introduce your bees. Good shake, most of them fall out. Once most of them are out, I just tilt this up and lean it right against the landing board. I let the rest of them go out. But that is my answer to that question. Try to get them in your hive at the earliest opportunity, as soon as the weather is decent. Um, and what's decent weather? So if it's, if it's below 50, you know, if it's 50 degrees and sunny, get them out there and get them installed. 55 degrees, the warmer the better. Okay, but if it's going to be 45, then keep them inside a little bit if you've got promising weather coming. Hopefully you've got a well-constructed hive and you're ready to get those things installed as quick as possible. Now, what if that can is completely empty? I didn't cover that. You need to be prepared to give them sugar syrup. So, notice that the thickness of this is about the length of their tongues here. So you could put your own can with holes in the lid of sugar syrup right on top and let them come to the surface and lick it off here. You can also spritz your bees right through the cage with sugar syrup, one to one, warm syrup, and don't soak them down, especially if you're gonna be storing them in your basement. But the best thing you could do would be to put a can upside down right on top with a feeder, sugar syrup in it, little holes in the lid. And by the way, if you can drill those holes, it's a little better than knocking them with nails, although some people do it with nails. Do a test, make sure it's not gonna leak all over everything, then set that right on there, and you'll see little bee tongues coming up and reaching it. In fact, if you wanna see how long the bee tongues are, you can just get the top of this wet, and you'll see their little tongues coming out beyond the surface, so you know that they can then reach you know, the lid of a sugar syrup jar that's upside down there. So that's the best way to keep them fed, but remember, those are emergency procedures. Your very best bet is to get them in the hive that you've set up for them as quickly as you can. So that satisfies that question. Next one is from Christopher Keeler. Question I have for harvesting the majority of uncapped honey and it permits would be able to turn the honey you collected that way into mead. Sometimes texting and stuff. Would you turn the honey into mead? Uncapped honey. Sometimes people think, by the way, what is mead anyway? Mead is considered one of the oldest alcoholic beverages that man ever made. That's an arguable point, but those who make mead, the local meaderies will say, you know, it's Viking drink. It's like the old stuff. And mead comes from honey. That's it. Honey is, mead is honey wine. So some people think, well, you know, it's at the end of the year and I've got, you know, honey that's in cells that are uncapped and the water content's really high. If I make mead with it, then uh, I'm adding water to it any day because what's in mead? Mead is honey, water, and yeast. Guess what else is in it? That's it. Honey, water, yeast. So, and it ferments. We already know that. So if you have a high water content, what's high water content? Anything over 19% water in your honey is considered high water content. Anything over 19% uh, would ferment. So everybody's smelled honey that feels like it's ripening, like it's getting a little nip to it, like it's, it's fermenting. That only happens when the bees can't attend to it because the bees take care of that and don't let that happen. So if you're taking apart a hive, happens at the end of the year, you're condensing down your hives. You don't have time for them to dehydrate all the honey out of it. So sometimes you're taking new honey that has high water content. Could you just take that and turn it into mead? You could. But I want to tell you something about making mead. And that is you want to get the best honey that you've got for that. The best scent, the best taste. Because don't just think it's a way of recycling garbage honey. Honey you don't like. 
get the best honey, the cleanest honey, the, the aroma that you think is fantastic, and get into making mead. A lot of us right now are stuck at home. And uh, you might find things to do with your honey. Maybe your honey market isn't as strong as it otherwise would be. Although around here, everybody is sold out of their honey. Everybody has more than enough buyers for it. For some reason, there's a run on raw regional honey from beekeepers. And that's a good thing for us. I'm not a honey seller, although we do sell surplus honey here. We don't, we're not in the business of marketing and selling honey, but for those who are, they are going to have a deficit. They're not going to produce enough to provide for the local demand for honey. But if you're at home and you've got jars of honey left over, how much honey does it take to make mead? If you're going to make five gallons of mead, you're going to use five quarts of honey. So one quart of honey, one gallon of finished mead. So it's good stuff, but you can get $20 for that quart of honey. So if you, you've got $100, if you make five gallons of mead, you've got $100 invested in honey alone. You've got to add your yeast. You've got to have all the equipment necessary to make mead, which by the way is more basic than you might think. Why am I going into all this detail about mead just to answer Christopher Keeler's question? Because I've been working on my mead video all day yesterday and I'm about to launch it this weekend so you can see how to make mead step by step every step of the way it has taken me months to make this video so you can collect that honey by the way what's a really great way to source your honey flow hives because it comes right out nice and clean no filtering no spinning no bits and pieces in it other than propolis and beeswax little bits of that won't hurt your mead so yes, you can use it. You still have to get the right gravity. You have to get the right consistency. So if your honey is thinner going in, you might have to use more of it to get the consistency you need for a good finished mead. A little poetry there. All right, the next is Blastoid 22. I got Man Lake Saskatraz package recently. They were good with notifying, but sent solo corked queen. I liberated her because they didn't have a marshmallow to plug the hole. Pretty lame design. But they took and the queen is laying. Almost no deaths. And I want to talk about that a little bit. It's true, when you get one of these bee buses, you get a different kind of queen package. So uh, most of you are used to getting a queen cage like this. It already has a sugar plug in it. And at this end, it would have a cork. And that cork can be removed for a fast release or you pull the cork out of the candy end and let the bees eat their way to the queen and then release her over a period of, you know, two to three days. Now, when you get the bee buses from Oliver's family there, the queen comes in a smaller cage than this and there are no workers in the cage. These come with workers in there and they feed the queen. Why on earth would they ship a queen with no workers in it? Well, a couple of reasons. One is that the way they're caged, when the queen comes by herself, the bees in that package are feeding her through the screen. They have full access to the queen. The other thing is sometimes it has happened where when people go to put the cage in their hive to release the queen, the worker bees that are stuck in there with her uh, may die because it could be at the end of their life or sometimes they get stung by the workers in the colony that they're about to be introduced to, the package of bees that they came with. Uh, so then what happens is the dead bees can plug the hole and the queen can't get out. By having no workers in with the queen, you eliminate that possibility altogether. So the solo queen thing is not new. It does look different to people that are used to getting a queen bee with a bunch of workers there in the cage with her. And of course you can make sure that the entrance, the candy thing is angled up. If it's angled down, then if those workers die, they plug the hole, the queen can't get out. Angled up, workers die down here the new workers eat their way in, the queen gets up and out without being blocked by the workers. So it's okay either way. And last year I did direct release two out of three of the packages. So two out of three of the queens I direct released. And just for giggles and to show people how it works, I left the one queen in there with the marshmallow. So instead of a candy plug here, you have a marshmallow, little hot chocolate sized marshmallows that you just stick in there and they shoot the marshmallow to get her out. They did that in a day. So either way, it all worked. Obviously it's worked well for Blastoid 22 here. 
and but expect it to be different so if you're used to getting the wooden cages you're going to get a plastic cage if you're used to getting a queen that's in a cage with two or three workers to feed her you're going to get a queen that's in a cage by herself and she's fed by the package themselves also if you do end up as we talked about earlier keeping your packages in your basement or whatever because you can't install right away that is more time actually for those workers to get more acquainted with the queen they're going to lick her and everything through the cage once they accept her and they're going to be spreading her pheromone through that package of bees while they're sitting there so they are actually becoming more acquainted with the queen next is from kathy gurney thank you so much for your help over the past year and it goes on to say a year ago last week, I went to the Olivares Hobby Days event in Orland, California. I picked up a package of Saskatraz bees and they did amazingly well. Just like you, we had a crazy winter, snow one day, 65 degrees the next. The Saskatraz built up very fast and while I was preparing for a second hive, they swarmed. I was able to lure them back into a swarm box and then put them into a new hive. They seem to be content, but I don't know what to do next, if anything. Should I leave them alone? Look to make sure I got the queen. They have some drawn out comb and honey frame that I was saving for spring feeding. Do I need to check the old hive to see if the swarm was a new queen or if the old one was superseded? I'm worried about chilling the brood as we are still cold days and cold nights. These are all good questions right now, by the way. I highly recommend that people that are in colder climates are not opening their hives yet. We're not in a nectar flow. Every time you open your hives, uh, you're bothering your bees. The other thing is if it's cold outside, they can't reseal. So they're still weatherproof from winter right now. How can you look at your hive and know if, for example, Kathy here got the queen when she hived everything up? How would you know that you have a queen in that box? We could assume that you have a laying queen and that you've got larvae if the bees are bringing in a bunch of pollen. The other thing is, what do bees do on the landing board in front of that entrance to let everyone else know that the queen is in residence? You're going to see a certain number of workers on the landing board right at the entrance and they're going to put their heads down and they're going to fan their wings like little aircraft that are warming up their engines before flight, but these aren't to fly. They're spreading the queen's pheromone. And you're going to look at the abdomen of those bees, and the abdomen will be elevated. It'll be slightly tipped at the end, and you're going to see a really light lateral mark just above the end of the abdomen, and that is the Nazanoff gland. They are scenting the air and fanning their wings so that the air moves across that gland and spreads out to let those who are still hovering around that might be foraging in the area or looking for their queen they follow that pheromone from the Nazanoff gland and they go right in there. And Nazanoff was a Russian anatomist. That's why it's called that. He discovered that gland and its function. So the Nazanoff gland you will see on the bees, which is different. You'll, you'll see the stripes on the bees abdomen and then one is very prominent at the end when they open that gland. It's very conspicuous once you see it. It is also very different from when they're just trying to vent a hive because in that gland, their posture is a little different. They're moving air just to move air and their abdomen does not have that opening at the Nazanoff gland. So hopefully I can find a video and put that up for this. But anyway, that's, those are ways to tell. Do you need to go in and search for them? Not really, in my opinion. I and mean, if you do, after a week or so, get in to look at things, Look only until you find out that there are eggs present. You see an egg, there's a queen that's been in there and laid an egg within the last three days. So you know they're good to go, close it right back up. Stay out, the more you stay out. Somebody else recently wrote to me that they were checking for queens daily, opening the hive daily, and then the hive swarmed. You can push a colony of bees uh, into a swarm mode just by interrupting the bees frequently. No one should be opening their colony and looking into their bees on a daily basis. That's too much interruption, that's too much invasion. The more you can learn from the landing board observations, bee behavior, pollen going in, Nazanoff glands, everything else to assess whether or not the colony is healthy, the better off you're going to be. Uh, the less often you open up your hive and get into it, the better off your bees are going to be. So make preparations now for expanding your hives when 
the nectar flow is on because you want to make sure they have lots of room for expansion in there and sometimes you can do all these precautions the person that just wrote me about uh, checking them all the time was also smashing queen cells when they found them so if you go through with your finger and you're smashing all your queen cells you just took away the insurance that they can generate a new queen because this queen is ready to hatch in there if they're all capped and uh, if your hive has swarmed or planned to swarm and you didn't catch it and off they went and you smashed all those queen cells, you just took away their ability to replace the queen. Because sometimes when the old queen is about to leave, she can stop laying for several days, if not a week. So then what are you left with as far as stock for them to rear an emergency queen? If you've been smashing the queen cells, how young does the larvae have to be uh, in order for them to make a queen out of her. Well, you know they're an egg for three days. On the fourth day, that hatches. If you've got, you've got a very tight window there, you have to have a very young, new larvae in order for it to be used for a queen. If that thing is four or five days old, guess what? It's too old to be turned into a queen. Open larvae is not enough. It has to be young open larvae. So larvae is plural, larva singular. So if you've got a larva, and it's 24 hours after hatching out of an egg, it's a good candidate to become a queen. They can still make a cell around that, create a queen cell, and have an emergency replacement for a queen that's suddenly gone. So it's a high risk activity to go through smashing all the fully developed queen cells, plus you're delaying everything. So I don't, I don't do that, I don't smash queen cells. Next one, Edward Norberg from Mansfield, Massachusetts. Uh, here we go. I hope your animals are well. I'm a beekeeper coming out of my first winter in southeastern Massachusetts with both colonies surviving. I started last May with a single nuke, nucleus colony, that I split once in June. The question relates to an observation to the queen that the split made and openly made it in my area. Oh yeah, this is interesting. What might cause a queen right colony to have multiple eggs and even larvae in the same cell? I did a full inspection today, April 12th, and most things in the colony seem strong. Plenty of capped worker brood, entire frames of natural pollen, a living queen, a good number of bees. Only thing that seemed low were the honey stores, and I'm feeding syrup for that. On closer inspection of the eggs and young larvae, I noticed that there were a significant number of eggs and even developing larvae in a single cell. Sometimes even three in one cell. They are all at the bottom of the cell and I saw the queen. So I did not believe it as a laying worker doing this. Below I have linked album images. Okay, here's the thing. Those are all Questions that I would have, first of all, when it comes to this queen, I want to see the queen lay an egg. So when you discover the queen on the brood frame, because these people see the queen, and the reason I say these people, Edward's the third person to contact me and show me pictures of multiple eggs being laid in full depth cells all the way to the bottom and even multiple larvae developing in single cells. So one beekeeper that watches all the time is in Germany. He sent me pictures. Okay, so another person is in Florida, and they have the situation. And here we are in Massachusetts with the same thing, queens laying multiple eggs. And me personally, I would want to see the queen physically lay the egg. But the other thing is, when it's a, a laying worker, laying workers tend to, because their abdomen doesn't get all the way to the bottom of a fully drawn cell. That's why I also asked Edward, are the cells full, full depth? Are they fully drawn? Uh, because a worker will sometimes park those eggs on the sides of the cell. They don't make it all the way to the bottom. So that's a tell right there that a worker laid those eggs because it wouldn't go all the way to the bottom. But then, like Edward, sent me pictures. They're right at the bottom. Not just that, they hatched. And the bees are letting the larvae develop in the cells as multiple larvae in a single cell. Cells are designed physically to accommodate one bee. So it'll be curious. I've not gotten any feedback yet from any of these three beekeepers uh, as to number one, did they physically see the queen laying eggs? And number two, 
do these bees develop all the way through the pupa stage and actually hatch? I'm guessing they won't make it because the cell's not going to expand to accommodate two adult bees that pupate completely. So I would think that unless the bees remove one of those larvae, one of those larvae, if they don't take them out and get rid of them, which is normally what bees do, if they find the nurse bees, the workers, if they find multiple eggs in a single cell, they'll show a preference for one over another and they usually get rid of them. But these are actually developing. So what's going on? I don't know. I would love to have others comment if you've ever had this happen, if you've ever seen a queen laying multiple cells. See, the problem we have with queens is when they're not very productive. When a queen is skipping cells, when a queen is not producing enough eggs that are fertile. So this queen, these queens in general, Germany, Florida, Massachusetts, they're all laying multiple eggs potentially in the cells. So what's going on? Anybody got an explanation for that? Because I'd love to learn more. Um, this is my 14th year of beekeeping and I've never seen it. And I pay a lot of attention to the eggs and the cells because I'm photographing them and videoing them. And I've never seen multiples like this. And I'm not just talking a few cells, multiples all over the place. So that to me initially would indicate the queen's not productive. Her pheromone is not strong because you know, if a queen has not been mated, she does not have the pheromone that a fertile laying queen has. And therefore the bees don't treat her right. Like she's the queen. Instead, we have workers that have the same reproductive system as a queen. It's just on a much smaller scale. Uh, can go into production mode and they can start laying drone eggs. So it'd be very interesting to get more information about this. And, uh, I'm interested to know what's going on and if it is the laying queen or if we do have a laying worker that just managed to get those eggs all the way to the bottom of the cell. So that's interesting. I appreciate that. And the only reason I commented on that today is because it's happening all over this year for some reason. Next one, Catman Clancy. DWV in two of my colonies. One riddled with it and a shook swarm and i'm in south ireland late treating in the spring my fault but i haven't seen it like this before very wet mild winter wonder is this a factor also do you think and what is dwv dwv is just deformed wing virus and sometimes you'll see bees uh, that will come out on the landing board and they're even partially developed if you've got like bee weaver bees and they're doing their hygienic Varroa resistant behaviors and they're pulling out, you know, developing pupa and larvae and everything else. Usually it's in the pupa stage that they're pulling them out. You can often see underdeveloped wrinkly little tight wings on those bees. And that is deformed wing virus. How do they get that? Well, it comes from Varroa destructor mites. So the Varroa destructor mite in itself is very damaging to the bees. It's going to feed on the fat stores of the bees. They used to say it fed on the hemolymph of the bees, but now we later found out that it was actually attaching themselves and feeding on the fat layer of the bees, which is very interesting. But in the process of doing that, they also transmit disease to your bees. And one of the most prominent diseases that they bring is deformed wing virus. And so when you see that, you know, you've got a Varroa problem. And so the question is here, should I treat? Yes, definitely. If I saw a landing board strewn with deformed wing virus bees, I would give them oxalic acid vaporization without even counting the mites because we're seeing physical evidence of a virus that comes with the presence of mites. So if you have that, you don't have to do a mite count, treat the colony. The other question is, do you think that we have a problem with mites now that's escalated because of a mild winter? Absolutely, you could have that, why? Because normally in winter, your bees will go through some period where the brood is reduced as you go through winter, as the really cold temperatures get there. There's always, at least in my bees, it's been my experience that there is some brood in there. So there's always some new bees hatching to replace those winter bees. Winter bees can live about five months. So they're heavier bodied fat bees that are designed to get your colony through winter. But if you have a really severe winter, the queen goes off lay. In fact, the brood frames, the temperature of the brood frames goes down a little bit, down into the 80s. Where if you've got active brood that are being minded by your bees and you've got the cluster around that, 
they're going to be from 94 to 97 degrees on the brood that has to develop healthy and hatch. So when you have a warmer winter, that's just my guess, we're just problem solving, speculating. But if you have a mild winter, what would be larger? You would have a shorter period of broodlessness. So what do Varroa destructor mites need to continue? They need to have brood. They need to get into those pupa cells and they need to reproduce in them. And then of course, when the new bees hatch out, they're coming out with Varroa destructor mites already on them, ready to go. So if we've got a warmer winter, we've got more opportunity, more brood, more opportunity for reproduction of the mites. If you're up here where we are and you get a really cold winter, then you have longer periods with smaller brood or some broodless periods, which breaks the mite reproductive cycle altogether. So it would result in smaller mites. It's also why some beekeepers, some commercial beekeepers, don't even treat for mites in the spring at all because they haven't had the time to build up their numbers as they normally would. But my recommendation to new backyard beekeepers would be in the spring as the weather gets warm, as the nectar flow kicks in and all those brood frames fill up with brood, it's a prime opportunity for you to do a mite count. So, and find out what your mite loads are. And then uh, of course, if you have high mite loads, then it's worth treating because what's gonna happen is your brood's gonna build right into the summer. You're gonna get these huge numbers of bees. The more reproduction there is, the more brood there is, the more opportunity there is for Varroa destructor mites to reproduce and increase their numbers inside your colony. And then as you get to late summer, early autumn, uh, that's when the numbers in the colony start to condense down. So then there are fewer hosts for the Varroa mites to feed on. So there are more mites per bee in theory. And that's why we have this big problem with mites at the end of the year, because they've been building all that time. And that's when most people do their treatments after that last honey flow extraction, uh, just before they're making preps to go into winter. That's when they do their Varroa mite treatments. But if I had this situation with a disproportionate number of bees showing uh, DWV, which is the deformed wing virus, I would treat for mites. And I would treat, if this is a small backyard apiary, I would treat all of them based on that alone. Oxalic acid vaporization is what I would use. That's all I use. Next is Kyle Register. Trying to figure out the best setup to have an upper entrance ventilation on my new Flow Hive 2. That's a Flow Hive 2 right there. Anyway, thinking ahead for later this summer, I'm thinking of putting a small three inch plastic circular entrance gate on the shim that's included with the carousel top feeder once I have my flow super on, which might not even be this year, and I'm no longer feeding them, I'd use the shim on top of the inner cover plug removed to allow access for foragers and for ventilation. The circular gate would allow me to close the entrance in the event of robbing while still allowing for ventilation, and the small size diameter should fit the carousel shim height. I'm attempting an adaptation of your custom rough lumber feeder my feet are shim. Uh, entrance. What do you think of this plan? Any ideas? Thanks. Yeah, here's my plan. The flow hives, all of them, either have screen bottoms or they have an aluminum slatted bottom that's very well ventilated through the bottom. Plus, they all have full width um, entrances with no entrance reducer. Sometimes I roll up screen and put it on the sides to give them an entrance reducer so that they can defend their colony and everything else. And I did build a flow hive with a vent on top, which a bunch of people got really upset about because they just ruined the look of the flow hive. And I used the circular vent just like I'm showing here. So this is what I did to the flow hive. I put that metal ring up there, which normally you see on nucleus colonies. And this is an example of what my feeder shim looks like. It's just a square box. It's got a bottom board built into it. And of course it has the vent that you control on the front. I'm going to say about the flow hives is there's already enough air movement just from the design alone uh, through the bottom that you really don't need to create an upper vent. And uh, 
The other thing is through the past year, I stopped using all of my upper vents. Although when it comes to the feeder shims, they have inch and a half diameter vent holes in the back with stainless steel screen in them. And not a single one of those was functioning as a vent because when the bees had the time, they sealed that right up with propolis on their own. So the bees told me by their modifications themselves, they did not want an upper vent. So the other thing is, Kyle says he's going to take the inner cover on the flow hive. There's a round plug in it and it's going to uh, allow the bees to go up through that and use this upper entrance. Well, the next thing the bees are going to do, because that's a pile of bee space. Uh, when you have all this open space up in the gabled roof of a flow hive, they are going to build comb up in there like crazy. So the space is going to be modified by the bees. There's no reason to need to let them go through those upper entrances anymore, not for venting purposes. The other thing is the way the flow hive is configured, that roof overlays almost like a telescoping cover. There's venting around the edges through the back. There's additional venting controls through the back of the flow hive too, which is what we're talking about here. So there really is no need, unless you're in some super hot area. Uh, it doesn't say where you're from, but you know, we get temps into the 90s periodically. You know, I'm not, obviously I'm in the Northeastern United States. It never gets hot enough here for me to need upper vents like that on the flow hives in particular because they're so well vented already. So this year I went into winter with no upper vents at all and 14 out of 15 colonies made it. So it turned out to be a pretty good move to let the bees modify things on their own. If they want venting, they could have it. It was there. They sealed it on their own. Be interested to see how that goes. Christopher Keeler, I want to know why you would allow a government agency on your property without a warrant. And this comment was made on my honey beehive inspection video, which is where the state inspector came and often comes and inspects the bees in my apiary because here in the state of Pennsylvania, you have to um, register your apiary. You're supposed to, a lot of people don't, but if you're following you know, the strict sense of the law, the Department of Agriculture wants to know where bees are being kept and you pay $5 a year or something like that to get an annual certificate. And I think now it's even good for two years. So Christopher's not alone in thinking that, man, I wouldn't want some government official just coming on my yard without announcing themselves and looking at my bees. It's none of their business, blah, blah, blah. And uh, there are a lot of people that are very protectionist against the man coming to look at your stuff. But I want to take a moment to talk about, uh, first of all, the requirement to register your apiary. So if you've got one or two colonies, you may never get inspected by the state inspector. There aren't a lot of them. I think there's like three or four in the entire state of Pennsylvania. Your state may not require you to register your apiary, but I highly recommend that if you're keeping bees, that you look up through your Department of Agriculture because honeybees are an agricultural activity and they fall under the control of the Department of Agriculture. Um, find out if you're required to register. You may just have to fill out a form online. You might have to pay a fee. I don't mind paying the fee. But why do we even have these apiary inspectors in the first place? I can tell you why. Because in my state, the state of Pennsylvania, way back the State Beekeepers Association wanted some kind of oversight on beekeepers in our state. So it wasn't like the Department of Agriculture sat around a big table and said, hey, there's a bunch of beekeepers out there. We need to go check up on those people. No, it was the opposite. It was the beekeepers themselves, the organization of the beekeepers that requested that there be a department within the Department of Agriculture that oversees apiaries in our state. Why? Because we want to know if there's a disease somewhere in someone's apiary, we need to have some kind of conduit, first of all, where best practices are disseminated, where we can know how we're supposed to keep apiaries. Uh, even moving your bees from state to state might be controlled by your Department of Agriculture and I see that as a good thing because we don't want people just transferring bees around willy-nilly, especially when there are bee diseases. One of the biggest things, American fowl brood, if that existed, and there was like one case a couple years ago down around Pittsburgh, 
Uh, if that happens, we want to know what's going on. We want to know what the problems are, and we want our Department of Agriculture to be the hub that oversees all of that. Because first of all, too, you're selling honey. Uh, we mentioned mead earlier. You cannot independently sell mead, by the way. You can grow your own and use it and probably have the barter system, but that's a whole story unto itself. But the reason we have to answer Christopher's question, this government agency inspector coming in is because we want them. I personally love it when that guy comes to look at my apiary. Why? Because I get to walk around for hours and talk to this guy and learn about what conditions other people are facing in their apiaries. What's working great? I can ask about equipment. I can ask about, you know, different lines of bees. Wow, did you get some really clean inspections? What kind of bees were they keeping? Uh, what are the configurations that are working best? Who's got the best practices? These are people that are seeing apiaries every single day. And many years ago, I went with that same inspector, and that inspector that's in this video is the reason I'm keeping bees, because I used to just photograph, video, and document bee conditions. I didn't even have bees of my own. And I don't know if he was tired of me, but he said, you really need to have your own bees and you could just stay in your yard and look at them yourself. And I thought, light bulb moment? Yeah, I do need to keep bees. So I have a great personal experience with our Department of Agriculture. And I look at these inspectors that come to look at our hive as a great resource for information. We can soak them for information. It doesn't mean they tell everybody about your home and who you are and specifically what problems you had. Uh, they talk in very generic terms. Many beekeepers are facing this issue. Many beekeepers have this problem. Many beekeepers have this great success. A beekeeper does this and it works fantastic. They don't share your personal information and stuff. So it's not the man invading you. It's because we want it. Guess who one of the first people in the United States was to actually want there to be a Department of Agriculture, thinking that it would be a great way to save time because if we have practices and methods and stuff that have already been tried and failed elsewhere, how could we consolidate that information? Lorenzo Langstroth, the uh, inventor of the Langstroth Hive Removable Frame Beehive, uh, was among those early apiarists that wanted to have a department of agriculture that thought that would be a great idea. So it's not them imposing on us, it's us asking for them to provide that service to keep beekeepers in the know and to, for us not to waste time on things that just don't work. Next one, none of your biz niz. None of your biz niz. Okay, interesting screen names. Hi Frederick, would the top round feeder fit a flow hive to cedar six frame hive? I'm looking for two round feeders that I can put right underneath the roof the diameter of the seven frame flow hive wouldn't fit in the flow hive too. Any suggestions? Thank you. Okay, here's the thing. First of all, I have already made my feeder shims because this is a problem. If you're gonna put this, for example, this wrap it around feeder, this thing will not fit in the six frame flow hive. The gable to roof it rests right on it. And even the seven frame just barely touches it, just barely fits in there. So what do I do? I make a little feeder shim thing, which you can just create a standoff here. So this is very simple. This is two and a half inches tall. You can cut pieces to match your flow hive top, and then just set this right on there, and it bumps up your roof just enough to accommodate the rapid round feeders here. And there's your feeder hole in the middle. So what it does though, which I don't like, is it sits right on top of the inner cover, this creates two joints now where you otherwise would just have one, but the overhang from the gabled roof of your flow hives is enough that not a lot of rainwater and stuff will interact with your inner cover and then the shim that you put up here to accommodate the feeder, create just enough of a standoff. This is something that I've asked uh, the flow hive inventors many times over because they do a video too showing you how to put a feeder up in your flow hive but it's always a little squat jar, you know, that barely fits in there. And uh, I would love to see the flow hives have a roof, the rim around that, be extended just enough to accommodate something like this, which is only a few inches tall. This hole fits perfectly 
right into that inner cover round hole which is designed for a feeder but this one does not fit because it's just too big around so you can come up with your own feeder but if we had flow hives just a little bit taller so by adding a shim like that you just create an airspace where you have room to work put the feeder in there when the feeder's not in place there's just a uh, wooden plug that fills that hole and uh, you're good to go but yep make your own shim and that's all i did was two or two and a half inches works you can buy the stock already cut at most of the lumber places and guess what home depot lowe's all those places are considered critical so they're open and you can go in there and buy wood if you want to now in my state anytime you're off your property or around stores and stuff you have to wear a mask to protect yourself and others but uh, you can go in there buy the stuff cut up a bunch of them make your own put two screws and glue it there together square it up and you've got a shim to accommodate any kind of feeder that you want and of course my feeder shims which there's a video that shows you how to make those they accommodate any kind of feeder and then because the inner cover is built into it you don't have an additional joint around the edges where your inner cover uh, might be exposed to weather and may not hold up very well to that kind of weather exposure so those are all the questions from today if you have a question of your own please write it down in the comment section below this video and i'll consider that possibly for answering next week if you know anything about those queens that are laying multiple eggs have you ever seen it before have you ever seen them develop all the way i would love to know more about that if uh, you want to support my channel you want to get like a shirt like this or something there's a teespring link in my video description down below thanks for watching i hope you guys have a fantastic weekend and i really hope we get warm weather soon so that we can install those packages and uh, look forward to possibly sharing a live chat coming up soon so thanks again. Have a great weekend.